please stand up and worship with us this morning.
a house of prayer because there is victory through Jesus and we might find ourselves in battles that we just can't seem to win maybe even battles within our own home our marriage our children our workplace a diagnosis whatever it might be but there's victory in Jesus and so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm sure you come with some things that are upon your heart this morning. You might be aware of some other needs in people's lives. Um, just making you aware of, of one prayer need that, uh, that I became aware of last night. And then I got uh, another text kind of about 4.30 in the morning giving me an update that uh, Shauna Harkinson, um, Jason had, had texted letting us know that she was having some heart issues and uh, they just couldn't quite get it figured out and get things stabilized. So they uh, flew her to Minot. And so we want to pray for uh, Shauna, that the Lord would just step in and bring healing and wholeness, that doctors would be given great wisdom to know what to do about that situation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning because he is a God of victory. So let faith arise in our heart you maybe can't win the battle, but the battle belongs to the Lord, and he is a victorious warrior. So let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning. We bring to you our lives. We bring to you the lives of those around us. And Lord, we come to you recognizing this morning that, Lord, so many times we cannot win the victory. But Jesus, you already have. And Jesus, we thank you that you died on the cross, you rose from the dead, and you are a God of resurrection power. And Lord, we invite you into these situations of our lives. We invite you into our homes. We invite you into our marriage, our, our parenting with our children. Lord, we invite you into those places. We ask you to begin to switch hearts and, and turn hearts like only you can. We pray, Lord, these different medical issues. We pray for Shauna this morning, God, that you would bring healing to her body, that there would just be a calm in her system and just an absolute restoration. God, touch her. Be with Jason, Lord, just strengthen them this morning. 
And God, we just bring to you the, the needs of those around us, the needs of our city, the needs of our area. Lord, you're the one who is a strong and powerful, a mighty warrior. The battle belongs to you. We honor you. We praise you. We need you. And Lord, in the rest of this service this morning, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to move in hearts and lives. We pray that the walls and the barriers would just be brought down and that your love, your power, your grace would come in like a flood. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do. We praise you, Lord. We honor you. And Jesus, be exalted here this day. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, church, as you get ready to have a seat this morning, can you greet your neighbor? Maybe there's somebody around you that you haven't met. Uh, just introduce yourself. Say hi. Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much. Well, welcome to Celebrate Recovery Sunday. This is a special Sunday for us. And uh, if you are new to Life Church or maybe you just haven't been here for a long, long time, we would love for you to connect with us. Um, on the bulletin that, that you received when you came in, there's a portion called the Connect Card. You can just rip it right off. And if you would fill that out and take it out to our welcome desks out in the foyer, there's a special gift that we have for you, and we just want to connect with you and let, uh, let you know that we're so happy that you're with us. Another way is, is through your cell phone, and so if you've never taken time to uh, put our church app on your phone, we encourage you to do that because that allows you to do things like a connect card right there digitally, or else you can also do some online giving um, using your cell phone as well. So we encourage you to take advantage of some of those things. And so please connect with us. We're so happy that you're with us today. Um, I'm going to invite our ushers to come and prepare for our tithes and offerings. We thank you for your faithfulness and giving, which allows us to do ministry here in the Williston area. And uh, if you've ever checked out the wall kind of in that part of the church, there's a uh, there's different missionaries, missionaries um, around the world that we support. And so your giving is r r literally going around the world. And uh, we want you to be aware, you're going to see this this morning, Celebrate Recovery in Action. But one of the, the major ministries of Life Church is Celebrate Recovery that meets on Tuesday nights in the Kids Sanctuary area. And... You might want to support uh, Celebrate Recovery financially. And so even in the offering this morning, if you want to give something specifically to the ministry of Celebrate Recovery, just make sure that you designate that on, uh, on the memo of a check or uh, you can just get a, one of those giving envelopes and fill that out. And we just encourage you to support uh, Celebrate Recovery. And as you will see this morning, there is a powerful ministry that happens on Tuesday nights here at the church. And so we, uh, we want you to be supporting them in prayer and through giving. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to worship you through giving. We recognize, Lord, that everything belongs to you. And as we give the tithes and the offerings, Lord, it's, it's a privilege. It's sometimes a step of faith believing that you are our provider, that you will supply all that we need. And Lord, we just pray that you would take these gifts, these offerings, these tithes, and Lord, just use it. Let the gospel of Jesus Christ spread through our city, through our region, and literally around the world. Bless the gifts and the giver today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to uh, check out the screens for some announcements. Hey guys, welcome to CR Sunday. I'm BJ. I'm Bethany. And we'd like to tell you a little bit about Celebrate Recovery. CR starts on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. We meet at door five, and there we work on our hurts, hangups, and habits. For example, 
I used to be addicted to Thanksgiving leftovers and I was able to quit cold turkey. And I was addicted to ice cream. That was a rocky road. Absolutely. Alpha is a series of sessions about life, faith, and meaning. They're gonna have two courses, one on Sunday and one on Wednesday. It's great for new beginners or anyone with big questions of life. Baptism Sunday is coming up on March 13th. Next Sunday is the last day to sign up. And if you'd like to be baptized, you can sign up at the Welcome Desk or on the Life Church app. Mm -hmm. A Life Church membership class is coming up on March 16th. If you'd like to become a member, you can fill out a membership form at the Welcome Desk. Membership is a great next step to become part of the Life Church family, so check it out. My name is Bonnie, and I struggle with anxiety and uh, everyday life. I'm Isaac, child of God, born again Christian, been delivered from drugs and alcohol, going on uh, eight and nine years. So. <laughs> We're going to read the 12 steps and their biblical comparisons. Number one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do, to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Philippians 2, 13. Three, we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Romans 12, 1. Number four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3:40. Five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5.16 Number six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. James 4.10 Seven, we humbly ask him to remove all of our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 1, And number eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6.31 Nine, we made direct amends to, each, to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Number 10, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10 and 12. 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Colossians 3.16 Number 12. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6 1. Hello, I'm Chuck, grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and um, I want to testify 2004 that I met the chain breaker, you know, set me free of drugs and alcohol, so. Um, next, we're going to have the skate guys, so enjoy. If he 
Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso. It's like, <laughs> but I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, dear heavenly father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. Well, gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm gonna use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up, here we go. Okay. Oh, hey God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward, but I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe four to five, maybe eight lines right here. That would be awesome. You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. With the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. <laughs> I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, you compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I got to admit, I, mean, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends, and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. See, it's a process. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish, it's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever gonna hear is at the end of your life, when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant, that's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize, heavenward. 
Oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years. These empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character when you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways are not oh, my ways. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning, I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both. What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um, I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. Chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult. And I go out and I, and I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I want to be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid. But you chisel away. Just be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not from me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me, I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know, reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just went, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's, it's a name, it's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying, it's more than a name. I wanna teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh my God. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I've messed up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? And I feel so useless. If you'll take me and use me, then God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too, and I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. 
this salvation that you hold. I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at it as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplines his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's going to be tough. Yes, but you bought into the life thinking everything was going to be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's. No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. That was beautiful. I'm going to be reading today's daily devotion. My name is Amy, and I'm in Celebrate Recovery for Life. I struggle with uh, addiction, anxiety, depression, fear, and life. Are you listening? Are you listening? My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James 1.19. You might be surprised to know that the average person speaks more than 16,000 words per day. That's a lot of talking. No wonder it's difficult for some of us to keep from monopolizing every conversation. I have no idea how long it would take to verbalize 16,000 words, but I can't help but think how, dif how different things would be if, if each of us spent half that much time just listening. Most of us are way more likely to be quick to speak and slow to listen. Think about how much we must miss when we are listening to our own voices most of the time. I've often found myself, especially in recovery small groups, thinking about what I'm going to say as soon as I get a chance rather than listening to what someone else has to say. Reflecting on those times, I realize that I wasn't showing much love or respect to the person who was talking. It may have even slowed my recovery. We all need to practice the art of listening, and I can think of three good reasons. One, we might learn something. Two, it's the polite and respectful thing to do. Three, God's word instructs us to do so. Let's all make listening a priority by consciously turning on our listening ears and then testing ourselves by asking each, after each conversation, what did I learn from that person? Father, help me to learn to listen to those around me, showing that I value each person by valuing what that person has to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, Life Church. I'd like to open this up in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this morning. This is your testimony, Father God. I just ask you to touch the hearts out here, whoever needs to hear this, Father God, that you would open their ears to hear, Father God. We just lift you up, lift our church up, Father God, and all the hurting that are out there, Father God, that you would uh, lift them up, Father God. We love you and we praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, my name is Ron. I'm a grateful believer that's been delivered from drugs and alcohol at, by the grace of God and a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I was born in November 1961 in Cincinnati, Ohio. My dad cheated on his first wife and got my mom pregnant with me. But after I was born, my dad left his wife and took my mom and my two sisters and moved to California. 
he left uh, four sons back in Ohio. I, was, I always thought this was my fault. A year later, my little sister was born, and then my younger brother. My story begins around five years old. My dad was a pedophile. He would take me and my little sister and molest us together. It was hard. At five years old, I didn't know how to stop him from what he was doing to us. It was hard to watch him hurt my baby sister. Again, I thought this was my fault. I remember lying on my bed and crying out to God, asking him, stop my dad from hurting us. But unfortunately, this went on for about five years. At the age of 10, I found out uh, he was abusing my two older sisters also. But my little sister was brave enough to go to my mom and tell her what was happening to us. Mom and dad were divorced, and dad was convicted as a sex offender. Back in the 70s, that didn't mean much. Mom was left to raise five kids on her own and put herself through nursing school so she could support us kids. She worked at night, went to school during the day. Dad didn't give mom much help uh, to take care of us. At the age of 11, I hit the streets running uh, around with older kids, stealing and using drugs. Yes, I started using drugs at 11. At 12, I met a family that lived in an apartment building we lived in. They seemed nice, but the husband and wife molested me also. In my mind, I started to think, is this the only way I can be loved is by having sex? So at the age of 13, I had my first girlfriend, and guess what? I got her pregnant. But her parents made her have an abortion. I always had a heavy heart over this because she was not ever able to have kids because of the abortion. On my 14th birthday, I got a different girl pregnant, only sleeping with her that one time. My son Eric was born July 1976. I didn't find out uh, for a while that he was my son. So hanging out with these older kids, we were having sex, doing drugs. I didn't, it didn't matter to me. I didn't care. But by the time I was 15 uh, years old, I tried, I tried every type of drug out there. And by this time, I was arrested 20 times from petty crime to armed robbery. I was sentenced to a year in juvenile prison. While I was there, I found out about my son. So finding out about my son motiv motivated me to try to change my life. So when I got out, I got a job doing whatever I could to make money, but the money was never good enough. Uh, so I started selling and running drugs. At the age of 19, I got married for the first time. I thought the world changed. My life uh, also, but this ended, or I'm sorry, I thought this would change my life also, but it ended up changing hers. She became my crime partner, and we both ended up in jail for selling drugs. When we both got out of jail, she got pregnant, and we were homeless, living on the streets of L.A., in our car for eight months of her pregnancy. Not a great place to be homeless. We would take baths and gas stations and eating anywhere we could, get a meal. The last month she was pregnant, a friend of mine, Robert Mata, uh, invited us to church. We both gave our life to Christ, May 15, 1984. I'm, I made a promise to God I would never be homeless again, and never was. Two weeks after giving our lives to Christ, we had a place to live, and I had a job, and my son Raymond was born, May 1984. But living on the streets had taken its toll on our marriage. My relationship with my, my wife got very bad. We fought all the time. I thought being a Christian, things would be different, but it seemed to get worse. 
So we moved to Ohio thinking a new place would make life better. Nope, after a year, I found out she was cheating on me. So after that, I pulled away from God. I thought, there can't be a God. Why would he put me through all this pain in my life? So I ended up leaving Ohio and moving back to California and left her and my son in Ohio. But weeks later, she moved back to Cali also. But we never got back together. When I moved back to Cali, I was in introduced to crack cocaine. I found my true love. It covered all the pain from my past, all my evil thoughts about wanting to kill my dad for what he had done to, to me and my sisters. Nothing up to this point in my life ever made me feel this good. I was a crack addict for 16 years. I would go into some of the roughest neighborhoods in LA to buy drugs and get high. I've been shot at and even stabbed. It's only by the grace of God I'm still alive. He had a plan for me. One long weekend, me and a friend decided to visit uh, her, her kids in Idaho. When we got there, I told her I was moving to Coeur d'Alene. Three weeks later, I moved there. There, I got, I got there, I stayed off drugs for about a year. About a year later, I met an awesome woman and fell in love. I got her pregnant with my third son, Josh. He was born in May of 96. And not long after, we started an insulation business uh, together, and we did very well. I thought I had it made. I thought I had made it. But one of my contractors I did business with sold cocaine and would sell it to a small group of people. I was one of those people. He lived in a million dollar home on a golf course and I didn't have to go to the hood to buy drugs anymore. I was somewhat of a, a functional addict at the time, if you want to call it that. I was in denial. I would work all week and only get high on the weekends. The sad thing is that I brought this new lady into my addiction also. But one day she came home and told me it's me or the drugs, I'm gonna leave with the kids. I couldn't stop, so she left. After we broke up for a few months, uh, she was out with friends at a bar. I found out she had a boyfriend. I walked into the bar and started a bar brawl. I found out the next day in this fight, um, a guy had lost his eye in the fight. I was arrested July 30th, 2004 for aggressive, uh, aggravated battery. I was facing 15 years in prison. While I was in jail, there was, is where my life changed. Well, what I should say, weeks before, some strange th things were happening to me. In the weeks before I was ar arrested, it seemed like I was meeting these Christians everywhere I was going. And they would tell me about Jesus, and I told them, I already know Jesus. Even a good friend of mine and business associate, Mike Lemon, that was a believer, he invited me to a men's breakfast one day, uh, one Saturday morning at Life Church, at New Life Church, uh, before I was arrested. I thought to my, myself, Mike must have told this pastor my story because he was speaking right to me. So I made an appointment with the pastor to talk about my stuff but I never made it because I was arrested. But Pastor David would come into the jail and visit me and pray with me. While I was in jail, there were, the, there's, there were these two guys, Miles and Bubba, coming in the jail, bringing in this program called Celebrate Recovery. They were tattooed bikers just like me. I knew if these guys could get to know Jesus, I could. They were coming in every week. I remember when Miles invited me to, to come uh, to his Celebrate Recovery when I got out. I remember sitting in the parking lot of the church for two weeks thinking, if I, if I go in, I would be struck by lightning for turning my back on, on God. But I finally walked in the doors of Celebrate Recovery at Real Life Ministries, and I was, I was greeted with love. I was home. 
with Miles inviting me to Real Life CR and Pastor David at New Life, who, who I call my spiritual mentor. Miles had, has been my sponsor for 18 years, and Mike is one of my best friends and accountability partners, partners for over 20 years. And to this day, these guys prayed constantly for me. Yes, I was convicted, and because of these prayers, I was probably given one of the lightest sittings on record. Six months work release. Because of my business, I was out for 13 hours a day of the 24 hours I was in work release. At the time, uh, they had CR Tuesday nights, Thursdays, and Saturday nights at Real Life. The judge would let me out on these nights so I could go to these meetings. I went through my first 12 step as, as a participant, and then I jumped into the next as a co-leader and then as a leader. Through CR, I have been able to help hundreds of men through these 12 steps. Real life was my CR church and new life was my home church. New life had these three crosses in front of the church. I remember driving up to these crosses with my pickup and dropping my, my, tailgate, my tailgate. And, and uh, I had a make-believe trunk with me, uh, with all my stuff, and I would pull it out of the truck. Uh, I asked God to take this all away. But I always seemed to put, put it back in my truck. It took time, and now I only carry a fanny pack. I still got junk. I went to Pastor David and asked him if I could start a CR at, at New Life, and he said yes, so we built our team and started doing CR on Friday nights. In 2006, I got married again. I thought God had picked the girl of my dreams. He, he did. Uh, we did uh, CR together, did motorcycle ministry together. I can't tell you her story, but she had a hard time dealing with her past. One night, she uh, talked me into going to the bar to have a drink. As I was sitting in the bar, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, and this lady said, what do you think you should do right now? It was my probation officer. I said I should leave. I was arrested the next day for a probation violation, and I was sentenced to another six months in work release. And while I was there, I read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelations. I'd wear a headset and, and listen to it from the time I woke up until I went to sleep. In those six months, I read the whole Bible. My wife and I ended up getting divorced, and then I thought we could fix it, so we got remarried, but it only lasted two years, and we were divorced again. I, will, I was losing my business because of the crash of 08. So I went to driving school to get my CDL. The director of the school said there's two places they make crazy money, North Dakota or Iraq. So here I am. <laughs> I, moved, <laughs> I moved to North Dakota in May of, two, uh, May of 2011. In July of 2011, I met my beautiful wife, Emily. The one God finally picked for me. See, years ago, Miles would tell me we had broken pickers and that we needed God to pick them for us. And so God finally picked that one for me. We met online. She was from the Philippines, but she lived in California at the time. Uh, what is a cool, uh, what's cool about this is when I was in eighth grade, I had a teacher that had us spin the globe and stop it with our finger. Wherever we stopped it, we had to write a paper on that place. I stopped mine on Cebu, Philippines. That's where my wife is from. Amen. That is where, uh, tell me that isn't God. On April 28, 2012, we were married on the river in Coeur d'Alene. This April, we have been married 10 years. 
We have our, we have our, thank you. We have our beautiful nine-year-old daughter, Faith. We are raising up in the church and, uh, and to be a follower of Christ. Last year, she gave her life to Christ and was baptized. I asked her, why do you want to get baptized? She said, I want everyone to know I love God. We must be doing something, right? I've been clean from drugs for over 17 years. And, and as, as of February 11th, I've been 16 years off of alcohol. God let me go to my dad and tell him I forgive him. Like it says in the step nine, we, make, uh, we made a direct amends to such pe people whenever possible. But through these steps, I was able to lead my dad to Christ and got to go back to that young lady I got pregnant all those years ago and ask her for forgiveness for the harm I caused her. My dad passed away eight years ago in a car accident, and then my mom passed away in 2019 from heart failure. As I watched my mom pass away, I got to pray with her and ask her if she knew Jesus. She said, don't worry, Ron, I have Jesus in my heart. And I've been praying for you for years. And I'm so proud of the man you've become. When I first met Emily, I asked if she knew Jesus. She said, sure, I was raised Catholic. But she had never gave her heart to, to Jesus. So I was able to do the sinner's prayer with, with her and led her to Christ. We were going to New Hope Church back then. I was working for this company where, here in town, and the owner saw my Celebrate Recovery tattoos on my arms and asked, what does that mean? So I got to tell her about CR and that I wanted to start a group at our church. She went to New Hope also. So we talked to the pastor and the church sent us to a one day training in Minneapolis and we attended the Seven Keys course. We came back and built the team and started CR and you know. Then, uh, and then I took CR inside Williams County Jail. We had over 100 men that gave their life to Christ in the time that I was going in there. Then the slowdown happened in 2016. I stepped down from CR and moved to Arizona, but we were only there for a season. We came back to Williston in 17. When we came back, we started attending Life Church. My good friend and accountability partner, Randy Gubrud, said you would love this church. And, and yes, we love our Life Church family. I talked with Pastor Chris about starting CR back in 17, but he, it just wasn't time. But when they closed down CR at New Hope in 2019, Pastor came to me and uh, said, we need to meet so you can tell me about your vision for CR at Life Church. Here's my vision. So we met and he said, yes, build a team. So I did. We launched CR August 19. Things were going well when COVID hit, and we had, but COVID hit, and we had to close down for several months. Well, we started back up in June of 19, and because of COVID, I got to start training a team in the Philippines via Zoom with Emily and our ministry leader, Mel Melanie Brock and Daryl Brock. We got to train Pastor Jim from Bradford Church and a team there in the Cebu, Philippines. We went through the 12 steps and worked through the ALT for over a year. Last two times we went to the Philippines, we started an outreach ministry called Back, uh, Backpack Ministry, where we can go preach and tell my testimony and give out backpacks to kids in the slums of Cebu. God is so good. Can I get an amen? 
I like to ask, what does the declaration of not guilty uh, that we find in Romans 3.22 mean to you? I could tell you what it means to me. I don't have to carry the pain of my past anymore. Then I am not guilty for what my father did or anyone else. I have been chosen by God to be a man of God. God has put me in, on this journey to help others through the hurts, hangups, and habits. I'm so blessed today to have my four amazing kids, six amazing grandchildren that love me for the dad that God has redeemed. I'm now the state rep for the Western North Dakota and the POC for Broken Chains. One of my life verses is Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. My other verse is Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For your Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. You now, through my, my life's battles, I've been through with my childhood pain and hurts. I give all the glory to God. This is what Celebrate Recovery is all about. I want to thank God and my Celebrate Recovery family for always being there. So uh, come please join us on Tuesday nights and see God changing lives. You are all God's master's masterpiece. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs>